Good afternoon to everybody. Um, my name is Leonardo Todisco. I, I'm Italian, but I'm based in Madrid and I'm an assistant professor of structure in the Universidad Politecnica in Madrid. And I collaborate with FECOR consulting engineers. So I try to, br to bridge the gap a little bit between theory and practice. And today really, I'm very happy to be here to, to present these fantastic guys. And we were strongly involved, I'm seeing Google here, for the first edition of this symposium in Madrid. And I'm super happy that now we have a second one. I hope that we will have a third one, a fourth one, etc. So the idea of this dialogue is to have a dialogue, which are just to interrupt ourselves, to speak, to share our ideas, our perspective, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I will move directly presenting the first speaker on the right. Paul Govreau is professor of civil engineering at the University of Toronto. He obtained his bachelor from University of Victoria, his master from Princeton, and his PhD from the ATH in Zurich, where he worked under supervision of Christian Mann. Until 2002, he was engaged in full-time bridge design practice in Canada and US, concentrating primarily on post-tension and segmental concrete bridges, bridge rehabilitation, and seismic retrofits. From 1997 to 2002, he was principal a stakeholder of John Mueller International and manager of the firms in the New York office. Professor Gavreau was appointed to the University of Toronto in 2002, and his research program is defined by a long-term vision of practical bridges that create value for society over and above what is currently done. Initially, this involved a focus on what we design, but more recently, the focus is of his work has shifted in how, how we design with a particular emphasis on how knowledge of previous design works can be used to improve the design process. His work has informed his approach to pedagogy at both undergrad and grad levels. Professor Govreau maintains an active practice as an independent consulting engineer and Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. The floor is yours. Thank you, Leonardo. Now, can you set up the slide, please? I'll put the PDF here. PDF, please. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Leonardo. Um, I'm very honored to be here. And frankly speaking, I'm very thrilled to be here among you uh, at this fantastic symposium. I've chosen to interpret uh, the theme of today's session, Challenging Gravity, Contemporary Structures for Our Built Environment, in terms of the following broad question. How will opportunities created by technologies outside our profession affect both what we design and how we design. These opportunities include new materials, new methods of construction, and new advances in information technology. I believe that the most important of these will be information technology, meaning the phenomenal growth in computing power that is likely to continue unabated and that has already shown signs of human intelligence. Information technology thus has the potential to bring about radical change in the way we design. And for this reason, I believe it will have a far greater impact on defining the characteristics of so-called contemporary structures of the future than new materials or new methods of construction. And so the question is very broad and I'd like to focus it on one specific aspect, namely in a future where high performance computing could dominate the entire design process. Should we make room for activities that do not involve the computer, such as hand drawing and hand calculation? Although others should contribute to this discussion from their own knowledge and experience, 
I would like to fo focus my own contribution on what I call practical bridges. These are works for which the owner has not allocated funds specifically to create an aesthetic impression. All they are interested in is the practical function. Practical bridges make up at least 90% of the total capital expenditure for bridges. But more importantly for this discussion, I believe, they are works where the creative decisions are generally made entirely by engineers. I do not want to exclude discussion of collaborations between architect and engineer, but I do want to make sure that the challenges faced by engineers who wish to design well are present in the discussion. We know it is possible to design entirely by hand. For any bridge designed before 1960, and even for the vast majority of bridges designed before 1970, all drawings and calculations were done by hand. This includes many structures of considerable complexity, such as the one shown here. We also know that the greatest designers of the past embraced handwork. This is a page from the calculations for the bridge over the Reuss at Wassen here in Switzerland, with drawings and calculations done in the hand of its designer, Christian Men. I'm sure there are some of us here, especially those my age or older, who have worked by hand and for whom working by hand provides a real sense of pleasure. But in today's discussion, I would like to focus on benefits that will accrue to the owners and users of the work we design. In other words, are there aspects of working by hand that enable us to create value over and above what could otherwise be done? I believe this question has two important aspects. The first is the question of whether or not working with limited means, which is the nature of handwork, is desirable because it requires us to focus on what is essential and thus challenges us to gain a deeper understanding of the structures we design. The Brooklyn Bridge shown here is an extremely complex structure that was designed with knowledge and skills that do not exceed what would currently be taught to third year undergraduate students. Is this significant? The second aspect pertains to the physical process of working by hand, which involves a cycle by which information passes from the mind to the hand, to the eye, and back to the mind. Does this process, which is unique to hand work, promote good design thinking? And if so, is there something worth keeping from the old methods of drawing with straight edge and scale? In addition to these two high level questions, I'm also interested in discussing two questions that are more basic, but in my opinion, just as interesting. For the designers among you here, do you work by hand? If so, why? If not, why not? And for the educators among you here, do you teach hand methods? If so, why? And if not, why not? This concludes my opening statement and I certainly look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for all the statement and I was thinking when, when I, I read your, your text about the main question of the first part. I mean, how developments in computing will affect uh, what you call practical bridges, the everyday bridge. And I start thinking if in the future we will have different bridges. I'm always referring to the practical bridges. And I was thinking that probably the answer is not because the, the classical typology will be the same in the next 30 years. Probably we will have different materials, better material from an emission point of view, better resistance, better durability, but probably the developments in information technology will affect a lot how we manage the structures. I mean, I believe that there are some techniques uh, the detection of cracks, 
corrosion, etc., that we can anticipate somehow with this kind of technology. But I believe that this will affect the conservation, but not the design. Do you agree with my vision? I agree with you to the extent that I think that things like um, uh, maintenance and this thing about detection of cracks using artificial intelligence methods and things like that, I think it may be a fact of life in the future for bridge management. I don't see it though as a significant driver for design. Um, I would say that, um, well, first of all, just step back. For these practical bridges, such as the one I showed um, in one of my slides, I think you're correct in the sense that these sort of structural systems, the canonical structural systems for these sort of smaller bridges, they seem to be sort of mature, well-developed, and it seems to be very, very difficult to do anything different and still remain cost-effective. Um, but as an engineer, I have to believe almost as an axiom that there's always a way to do it better. And that's what keeps moving forward. I would say that, you know, we, we marvel at the big suspension bridges, cable stayed bridges, and that's all well and good. Those structures deserve to be celebrated. They're fantastic structures. But I would say in terms of really tough challenges for designers, it's going to be these smaller bridges for which these structural systems are so well entrenched at this stage. I would say one of the factors that's going to, to change possibly those structural systems in the future uh, will be possibly the introduction of um, robotics into heavy construction. And we've seen sort of little sort of steps forward in the research realm thus far. But I would say that, and this is something that I think that Aurelio alluded to before lunch, um, but in a different, for a different reason, I think that the ratio of labor to, to cost, labor to, to material cost is going to change because the cost of production is going to be made cheaper because it will be replaced by people will be replaced by machines. If that's the case, that's going to create fantastic new opportunities for developing structural systems that are more efficient. And then comes the challenge of how do we take advantage of that opportunity? Does drawing by hand fit into that? Do calculations by hand fit into that? That's a question that I pose to everyone. I think it might. So in other words, I don't think that, that, that necessarily from a, from a design perspective, that moving 100% towards sort of computer-assisted or computer-driven design methods are inevitable. And I think that if we do go that step, let's think through very carefully about what we're gaining and what we're losing. Thank you. Alejandro, do you want to add? What do you think will be the bridge, the practical bridge within 30 years? A difficult question. I, 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 I'm not sure that new materials uh, will appear that will suggest like new bridges to be developed. That that like that was the case uh, several years ago. I think, however, that maybe uh, combining typologies might give some perspectives, some possibilities on development. Uh, also related to to the fact that we have like more advanced techniques that allow us to analyze, to construct uh, more complex, uh, uh, more complex systems. This on on one side, several years ago, uh, allowed like solving like complex forms that were not or not directly related to a uh, structural behavior. But it also allowed to combine typologies and to focus on more uh, complex perspectives that can somehow be related to the structural requirements on the basis. So, and maybe some, some of these hybrid um, typologies could suggest or, or could have the entity of, of developing new kind of new, new types. But, uh, but I'm not sure. I, I think they, usually they, these new types have, have been related to new materials. Um, I'm not sure. 
I'm, I'm not so certain about these new materials or advanced properties of existing materials that will suggest uh, new types or new constructions or new shapes. Thank you Thank very you. much. Aurelio? Yes, and th thank you, thank you, Paul. It's uh, it's very interesting what you have uh, uh, presented. Um, wh what I alluded before the lunch is that um, we will we will be forced in a near future to uh, use ma uh, less and less materials. Not because they are, they will be expensive, but because of carbon footprint. And to me, it's a very good thing because we were, we, this will force us investing more time in, in doing good design. Uh, but I, I, wanted to, I wanted us to ask um, an, a question or perhaps, or, or to add an alternative statement. Um, well, we belong to the same generation. We belong to the same education. We had a sim very similar education. I have also studied by, with men, Christian men. And for, for me, of course, still nowadays, it's very important to draw by hand, to do uh, uh, sketches uh, uh, in scale, and to do very simple hand calculations. But, and, 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 this is, and this to me, it's a very powerful tool because there is a direct link between a, a, a very simple hand calculation and the verification of the intuition. This is, very, this, is, this is a very direct link. But, and this is a kind of provocation, is in the future, is if in, in, in the new uh, future, it will be possible to have uh, electronic tools which allows us to have the same result. I mean, a direct link between verification and intuition. Is it not bad? Is, is it not better that you switch to the new tools? So I, kind of, I, 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 I admit it's a kind of a provocation, but I would like to, to hear your opinion. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good question. I, I think that, that you know, I'm, I'm loath to, to, to predict the future. I, I don't want to predict the future. Um, that's why in, I kind of went through it to the back door a little bit. In, in thinking about the future, I wanted to talk about the past, basically, which was, you know, the hand stuff. But I think it's possible. I, I think we can't imagine, basically, what will be available in terms of tools, um, say, 20, 30 years from now, even sooner than that. And the question is, um, you know, if those tools do the job well, um, why shouldn't we adopt them? And I would say that, that, yeah, if the tools really do do the job well, maybe we should adopt them. But I'll say this, that up till now, I would say that, again, for, for the, in the realm of practical bridges, not the big suspension bridges and the cable stays, but in the realm of the practical bridges, most of the work of most engineers, I don't see a huge increase in the quality of the end product that has gone along with basically a massive adoption of computer methods and uh, connected to that a massive um, um, uh, dropping of, of hand methods. And so I would say that the, whatever tools are, are developed between now and, and the future, they're going to have to be significantly different from the tools that we've had uh, already. The other thing I can say is that, is that when, I, when I think about the, the pleasure that's associated with designing, the, 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 the distinct, deep, strong pleasure that I feel as a designer, honestly, I don't feel that when I'm bashing at a computer. I feel that when I'm drawing. I feel that when my hand is pushing a pencil on the paper and I'm completely focused on it. That's why I talked about this physical process. There's something about involving the hand. I, I don't know exactly what it is, but there's something about involving the hand, slowing down, doing the work that somehow draws you in, focuses you. It's like a good cup of tea. It stimulates you and relaxes you at the same time. And, and, and if those new tools can do that, 
And I say, fine, I think that's pretty good. I'm a little skeptical yet as to whether or not they will. If I may just add one yeah. sentence. I, I don't think we should, uh, I'm actually, I've, I'm fully with you. So uh, the hand sketching and um, this design process is actually very important. And I think it will stay a fundamental part of our, of our doing, but um, once we understand all the digital tools rather as support mm -hmm. and not as a replacement of ourselves, also not of this creative procedure that results in joy, um, then um, the, the outcome is basically data. And, and I believe that um, data is something that, I mean, there's all kind of data mining and uh, harvesting and all these things. So I think that's something that helps us to understand these structures even better, also these practical mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and buildings and bridges that are there in thousands, yes, because if we save 10% of that, it has a much it's a huge multiplier. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge yeah. multiplier. So that's yeah. uh, what Aurelio also mentioned. And um, so if we document that and if we have it available for future projects and for future generations, I think that's something um, that uh, the digital transformation helps uh, achieving. So uh, I'm not scared of uh, being replaced by artificial intelligence. Uh, I, don't, I don't believe too much in that happening in the next uh, 15 years of my work. Um, but but um, I, I understand it as an aid and then it's mm -hmm. less painful and less skeptical also yeah. to, to work with. No, I agree with you. I don't, think that, I don't think that we are in any danger of being replaced by artificial intelligence in our profession, at least in the lifetimes of everyone who's, who's here in this room. But, but I think that there is um, a distinct possibility that um, certain engineers, certain firms will be using the pencil even less than they're using it now. And certainly we've seen a distinct decrease yes. in the use of the pencil. And as I say, I think we are at a point now where we can, we should ask the question, what do we keep and what can we let go? And I think it's especially important now because, you know, engineers who did grow up using the pencil, at least in the early years of their, of their, of their profession, um, they're retiring now. And, and so, so I think that it's, it's, it's good to raise this question uh, now at this stage. Yeah. Yep. What do you guys do in your firm? Do you work oh, with I'll, by hand a lot? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's, it's uh, fundamental. Uh, been educated by uh, Jörg Schleich, by Jörg Schleich and Rudolf <laughs> Bergemann yeah. to, yeah. Um, to do that. And um, no, no, that's, um, that's always the starting point. But what we notice is that, um, for example, the, the processing of ideas and um, visibility checks and comparison, not only the structure analysis, but also the whole constructability and life cycle assessment, all these things. This is so much simplified by these digital means. And I must say, we are, of course, often working on individual designs and, uh, and then the exploring of different solutions mm -hmm. is much, much simplified. So mm -hmm. it's the... I'm not saying that this is always good, but the whole procedure is so much accelerated. Um, um, I'm not I'm not sure if it's healthy, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but um, it's it's very fast. A lot of alternative solutions can be compared, but there's still the sketch and the understanding that the proportions are right, mm -hmm. which is fundamental for the, mm -hmm. uh, to re result in a good project at the end of the day. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we have to jump to the second, Lara. Yeah, I for the... wanted to clarify because I think they are very high level engineers and they don't do the maps or something. But I work in a bridge as bridge designer. And what happened in reality is that we have the tools, but you always have to check that the model is giving you right answers because otherwise you, you have like, this is failing and you have to understand if you have put the right input or something because you cannot believe whatever the model is telling you. You have to have the knowledge. You have to, to do your own simplifying numbers to check. And that is not going to change in the future with new tools. You always have to be sure that what the machine is telling you is right. So that is happening right now. And good bosses always tell you to do a quick hand check if if you are a graduate or a, in a low level and nobody tells you to do a hunt and you don't understand the number, you just believe what you are is when problems and errors happen. So it's just us. Okay. I'll, I'll just, just say yes, one thing to that. I'll say 
for sure you're correct with that. For sure you're correct, but sort of the 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 the, the practice of engineering that I foresee is, or that I the, the picture I have in my mind is not one in which hand calculations are just to check your computer work. I visualize a, 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 a practice in which um, in which handwork plays a, a much more important and fundamental role, uh, specifically as a as an enabler of, uh, of of creative thought. So I think that that's certainly one dimension of handwork, checking your computer stuff. But I think there's much more out there than that. Thank you very much. We have to jump to the second part. So I will introduce uh, Alejandro Bernabeu. He's a civil engineer graduated from the Technical University of Madrid and the uh, L'Ecole de Pont Chaussée. And then he got the PhD from UPM too. And he is an expert in structures of singular buildings with 20 years of experience, currently director of its own consultancy firm, Bernabeu Ingenieros, founded in 2014. He has developed a project worldwide, working in collaboration with a lot of architects, such as Elza Guimaran, uh, David Chipperfeld, Dominic Perrault, Neto Sobejano, Rafael de Laos, etc. Recent projects include the Mohamed Six Tower in Rabat, a 250 meters high building in Morocco, a Banco Santander Museum in Santander, the Lima Convention Center, and the uh, footbridge that we'll see in a couple of minutes. He's a professor at the School of Architecture at our university uh, since 2008, and he is a lecturer in different other universities. He's the author of 13 journals of conference papers, etc., and investigate the relation between structure and architecture. Alejandro has been awarded the Yavse Prize in 2015 and with the, and the prize for outstanding young engineers in 2013 by the Spanish Engineers Association in Madrid. And his work has, exposed, has been exposed in the exhibition, The Bones of Architecture, that took place in Lisbon in 2013. 2019. Thank you very much for coming and the, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Uh, I would like to share a couple of thoughts that I hope might bring some interesting topics to talk about. First thing, uh, Spanish abstract artist Antoni Tapies on said he started a painting by drawing a line tracing a gesture. Then the painting was the attempt to correct this first line. I think that to create or to design something, we need a starting point, a requirement. And structural requirements, especially when they are challenging, are a very interesting starting point. The ambition to, to, to rise higher constructions, to span uh, larger spans, to, so, to save larger spans has, has been always been an ambitious challenge and structural requirement using structural design to evolve and to innovate. This is a project we have been working in the office uh, the last two or three years. It's a footbridge linking together Spain and Portugal, spanning 280 meters. It's an every typo typology, um, a complex self-tensioned spatial structure that combines uh, a suspended structure, a suspended bridge in elevation with the arch effect of the, of the deck in the floor plan. For this, we developed uh, to get working in collaboration with Ole Olbrook and Pierluigi Dacunto that are here organizing the, the conference also, uh, in developing a, a complex form finding process that helps understanding and developing the project. But we also work it with physical models and with human models that help us understanding the conceptual, the concept uh, and the structural behavior of the project. But the structural requirements are not only linked to technical or gravity challenge technical requirements, Social and environmental concerns may also consider as a starting points as key factors. Sustainable construction is in that sense a major concern. And there is no greater sustainable construction than to be less. To maintain 
and to rehabilitate existing constructions. Rehabilitation, renovation, retrofit. A couple of projects on rehabilitation, uh, concrete structure from the 50s, Madrid, and the, rehabilita the rehabilitation of a building from 1890, in which stands out the spawn spiral staircase. These spiral staircases are a very singular structural and constructive type that even nowadays, well in the, into the 21st century, are not fully understood. And especially not with complex finite, finite element models, but in any case with classical graphic uh, statics and traditional constructive criteria. And last idea, last thought about the design process, which I think relates a lot on which Paul was talking before. This image is by the uh, artist Luis Gordillo. Luis Gordillo, since the 80s, takes pictures of their paintings, of the design process, the, the creative process of his paintings, that then he exhibits together with the final painting. And it represents like a trace of this creative process, an archive of the lost or discarded ideas. I think that in the current context in which in media she prevails, where the projects are asked in less and less time, and which current development, developments and techniques of analysis and constructions point straightforward to the final result, I think it's necessary to claim for the design process, for the importance of the design process in itself, not only in terms of the final results, but in the process itself. A process by which the project moves forward, but also takes steps back, a process by which the, the, pro the project mature, matures and, and, and evolves. A process, a journey that has to be considered to take the most of it, and especially that has to be enjoyed. And that's it, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alejandro. Uh, very inspiring presentation. It was nice because the first bridge that you show, we participated, we were involved in the competition and we lost. So it was I'm totally unhappy. Are you too? Oh, we're about. <laughs> <laughs> but the final result is very, very good. So congratulations for that. And speaking about this footbridge, it seems to be that uh, recent tendencies in bridge design are based on uh, hybrid typology. I mean, in your case, you are mixing two typology, extra doses bridge are the result almost or less of two different typology. Do you think that in the future, we will see more this kind of mix of structural typology or we will have totally different structural typologies? No, I, th I think you, I mean, comment is pertinent. I, I think it will see more this kind of hybrid typologies or even hybrid materials as we saw this morning with this uh, timber and concrete uh, construction that was really interesting. And I think somehow it's an evolution of what uh, analysis and construction techniques allow us to do. When, when first we had like a lot of power of analyzing complex forms and geometries, I think the initial point was like to, to solve a, a complex form and geometry that came from, from a gesture, from a drawing, but who was not maybe related to structural requirements or structural behavior. But we have seen now that, that it allows us to combine uh, different structural behaviors, different materials with different properties that of course has a uh, complex behavior and complex uh, analysis behind. And I think it's, it's an interesting field that, that, um, that may suggest maybe not like new typologies, but combinations that may be interesting to propose new solutions or, or altern alternative considerations. I think it's an interesting point. Thank you. I can, I can check any hands. No. So uh, the second slide was based on Aurelio. I'm trying to animate the, the debate from me, from, from, yeah. Uh, 
I, I'm very interested to um, to the to the to your example of the staircase. Um, um, to me, it is very interesting because it shows that uh, in an empirical manner, builders were able to uh, build a, a structure which cannot understood by most of engineers nowadays, which is almost not possible to verify with with current uh, tools. And uh, to me, this is a very interesting example of the role of um, empiricism in, in, also in designing. Uh, do, do you think that that's this contribution? And like, uh, in fact, empiricism is something similar as inspiration. Do you think that can be enhanced in, in, in the future? I don't know. I think uh, in, to, to approach an existing structure with current uh, analysis techniques is maybe not the, the most proper or the most adequate way to approach it. Um, I think before we should take like a step back and try to, to fully understand how it was considered, how it was uh, thought and how it was constructed. And then afterwards we could maybe apply other techniques and other things, but I think what which is inherent in this construction must be fully understood before. And I need that to respond to your question, uh, Felina. <laughs> I, I asked this question because some years ago, a good friend of mine, an architect, asked me how, how such a staircase works. And they was not able to answer, in fact. Mm -hmm. And then I spent uh, one hour in doing a small, a small model, a very, very, ba very basic uh, physical model, just some pieces of wood. Mm -hmm. And then after this, for me, it was completely clear and very easy to understand. And I think that in many cases, this... Mm -hmm. This this kind of working is 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 lost for us for our engineers. Yeah, I totally but, agree. Uh, and, but there are also other cases for sure. This is just mm, one example. Mm, and I think which is interesting is in this case of stone staircases, it's like very clear that we cannot approach the same way uh, as we do with other structures. But I think on, also when we consider uh, ancient reinforced concrete structures, we may not apply the same, we, we may not, we have not to approach it the same way we will approach a new reinforced concrete structure that we will build now. And for the stone staircase, I think it's clear and almost everybody will, will approach it differently. But for a reinforced concrete uh, structure, even if it's uh, dating 50 years, uh, 50 years old, I think the temptation to approach it the same way is, is, is more easy. We will do it the same way. And, and I think we, we should approach it differently. We, we should think as they thought when, when they design it. Thank you. We have a question. Um, <clears throat> hello, Mark Snowback again. Um, but this session topic is about gravity. And when you analyze structures, you use, usually use gravity turn on. That is, you uh, have a 3D analysis model and then you suddenly apply gravity to it, neglecting completely the way it is constructed. And from what you said about robotics and, and the renewed inference of construction methods, it occurred to me, and we talked about that in, in, in the interim, uh, in the interval, that um, both Nervi and, and Fresnay, for example, they were contractors. So the, the, the wisdom and the knowledge and the experience about cons um, a building and building sequences and, and precasting and all that should uh, play a role as well, I think. And this has not been addressed because here among us, we are architects, we're engineers, but we're not contractors. So what is the role of the fabrication method and what do you envisage about that? I think it's, uh, if I may, it's, uh, it's a very important aspect of a good design, um, whatever good design means. But as uh, soon as you have proven during your uh, early conceptual phase already how 
uh, construction procedure could work and um, that this is still meaningful and, for example, doesn't eat up more resources uh, than the project itself, um, then uh, it could it at least uh, keeps the option of uh, becoming a good project. And uh, so in our world with uh, longer span structures and uh, a lot of cable structures and so on, this is really fundamental to understand how um, how this how we would build it up and how it's constructed. So the the Baumeister um, um, let's say assessment is really uh, a day to day business and it's, I, th I think it also it should be uh, part of every project should be part of uh, the of teaching at universities to understand how things actually physically work so I, I can also follow uh, what Aurelio mentioned there, but how it helps in understanding existing structures. Uh, um, this would need to be seen because they are already there. So that brings us again to the digital future. The, oh, the chair. <laughs> <laughs> this is not. Oh, this, is, this is not very sustainable. <laughs> but um, so once we understand how how uh, structures work, and for example, um, how a reinforced stair is uh, built, and Thanks. I'm, I'm good. Um, then we can document it for the future and uh, um, that may enhance its lifetime. And um, that's something that makes things again more sustainable. So just to close that circle as well. Thank you very much. So let's jump to the third part. <laughs> so the third speaker is Knut. Knut received his engineering degree in 1999 from the University of Stuttgart and started to work for SBP in 2000. And after the delivery of several large scale infrastructure, sports and entertainment projects as project manager and team leader, he joined the management of SBP in 2008 and founded the SBP Latin America. Since 2015, is a partner and managing director of SBP, and he develops and manage diverse projects worldwide and support design partners and clients with, with his hands-on approach beyond structural engineering from the early project development through the detailed project design, site monitoring, etc. Together with his team, is among the leading experts in the field of special and lightweight long span structures with a particular focus on sport and multipurpose venues, cable and membrane structures, stadium roofs, and movable and retractable systems. Knet lectures are around the world, and easy projects received a great number of awards, both in Europe and internationally, and most recently for the new Stadium Wanda Metropolitana in Madrid. Thank you very much for joining us. Sorry. I've started. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thanks, Leonardo. And thanks all for uh, listening to us. Um, first of all, I must say something about this gathering. It feels uh, very special and uh, uh, I haven't had this in one and a half years now um, to see people uh, live and you're obviously not some uh, holograms. So I enjoy this a lot and uh, thanks for coming. Um, and then um, when you look around here, I was actually really intrigued by the venue that uh, the organizers have chosen. Thanks also for that. Very well, not only very well organized conference, but very well chosen venue, which is equally important. Um, and when you look up and you see this beautiful truss uh, built of concrete, amazing, probably nobody would do this or dare this today. Um, this uh, in my life and in my world explains what we are here for. And it's the, it's the beauty of structures actually. And from a structural engineering point of view, I, I call it, it's a wonderful structure. And from an architect's point of view, it's probably a wonderful architecture uh, that had a good engineer. Um, but uh, this is what it's about when we um, follow our um, beliefs in what we do in our daily work. So we, we leave an, a print on our uh, planet 
um, with whatever we do. Sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. Um, and what happened over the past uh, decades is that we somehow started, when I say us, I mean all of us, uh, mankind basically, I assume. Um, so we, we, we understood that we, um, we have to um, understand better uh, what the consequences of our um, doing is, what the, what's the consequence of our projects. Um, and um, why? Because our world is changing and we are all uh, suffering to a certain extent at least. Um, and um, so what we are doing is actually we're trying to understand how we can contribute with our uh, work to um, reducing the impact that we are still producing. So we want to have a very realistic approach to the whole sustainability discussion, which is absolutely fundamental. But um, it's equally fundamental to understand that uh, today we are 8 billion and in 50 years or so we are 11 billion. Um, and everyone has the right of uh, living under, let's say, acceptable living conditions. And uh, our living conditions exceed the, this by far, I must say. Um, but uh, that explains also that we have to continue building and con continue to use up resources more and more and more. Um, and that explains also why we uh, need all our brain power to invent new stuff and, and, uh, and uh, also reinvent or rethink things that have been uh, like this for uh, a long time, because we simply have to do something. So this is our circle of, um, let's say, a, a, a project uh, assessment or uh, configuration. Um, we, uh, we want to um, act all together more holistically and more sustainable. Sustainability is a very, very big word, especially when it comes uh, to construction. We, we all understand how much resources we use. Um, so um, it's not about greenwashing. It's not about coloring the web page green. It's about really making a difference. But we must not um, forget that we have to have the joy of designing something because otherwise we don't do it anymore properly. We need creativity. Um, we need to understand the past homage to maybe improve the future. And all of this um, leads in our understanding to things that we call beautiful. And um, we find this uh, healthy for us and uh, for, um, yeah, for our environment. And having said something like that, the beauty of structures or the beauty of construction um, in the same word with football is maybe very strange at first sight, but it's also human. And that's something that uh, is important to accept that we will continue to uh, be uh, entertained. We want to be entertained. We need to um, provide distraction to us because otherwise we all freak out. Um, and um, I chose this example uh, specifically because uh, it's a stadium for the uh, Soccer World Cup in Qatar. Um, Soccer World Cup, Qatar, and so on. So this is all things that we can discuss in a separate round. But um, we uh, developed many, many stadiums around the world. Jörg Schleich was involved uh, in the 1972 Olympics. So there uh, it started. And But this is a game changer. And uh, it's a stadium that... Uh, we developed um, and uh, realized now, which can be reconfigured in countless other configurations. So it's one stadium that suits up to the quarterfinals, but everything is modular. Everything is more or less identical. It consists of uh, identical modules, which can be put together in a different order to recreate smaller arenas, smaller venues. And um, the idea is to um, well, the idea was first to win the competition, then to convince the authorities to build it. Everything is based on containers. This is how it was supposed to look. And we were actually uh, surprised by ourselves that they, uh, it was actually selected and built. This is uh, an older picture. It's finished now. Everything fits into the containers. Everything is repetitive. And um, every label at each member has a force capacity and uh, the suiting uh, member that with which it can be connected so that you can play around like a kit of parts. Um, so after the World Cup, it will be taken down. It releases uh, a massive and very expensive piece of land in a prime location. Um, it's not going to be another white elephant. And that's a game changer in the world of entertainment. It's still entertainment and uh, 
maybe has not that significance for some, but uh, if we uh, continue to invent things like this or to modify things like this in all aspects of our doing, we believe that we can still have a very positive impact on, uh, yeah, on our future. That's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, generally, in this kind of structures, you are using a very high technology. For example, just you told us a few weeks ago that for the Mestalia Stadium, are using TMD, or for some bridges, you are using uh, uh, carbon fibers instead of steel. So my question is, do you think that this kind of high technologies can be used to either normal bridges or they are will be used only for very special specific structures how would you say it? yes um well i think that um first of all there's basic there has to be an attempt to make use of these technologies or of different technologies to to learn and that there's a little bit about empiric uh, studies of course um and and but by just thinking it over and not building it, um, it, it would remain like a theoretic uh, thing. So we are really trying to implement these uh, new ideas and technologies uh, into real projects to understand what's the commercial impact, what's the social impact, what, uh, uh, how can we improve lifetime of, uh, of, um, of buildings, of infrastructure. Um, and from that, we learn if it could be a mass product or not. And in, for example, in terms of mass dampers, and this, I, this is in my eyes already common practice to, uh, to enhance performance of certain buildings of floors of slabs or of bridges with, uh, with uh, tuned mass dampers in order to avoid using up too much structural mass, but still uh, create the comfort that people are used to, um, to, to use it, for example, towers or footbridges. And the footbridge would not fail if you don't have this mass damper, but people would maybe uh, feel not so well if they cross it and it moves too much. So it's always the balance of uh, usability and uh, structural performance. And some, um, uh, for, for example, this uh, Mestaya project is, uh, is uh, reducing the utilized quantity significantly because it's a single layer structure. And that has of course an, uh, also a sustainability aspect because it's simply less waste of material. Thank you very much. We have a question here. The microphone is, well, uh, you can start here if you want and then we can jump here. Well, reusing a member's both structural and non-structural is certainly one approach. But rem remembering what uh, I think Aurelio said, that um, the lack of resources will uh, bring about more and more efficient and slender structures. What about recycling materials? Because then perhaps we, we can't or we shouldn't um, have such sl slender members and we have to reduce the, the work stresses and the allowable stresses, so to speak because they are reused materials. And that would also create a new kind of design, I presume. Um, Germany, I think, is not so good in recycling concrete yet, um, but perhaps uh, Schleichenbergermann has some approach to that. Um, there's actually, it's a, it's a very good point. There's actually a, a very um, innovative uh, rec concrete recycling firm around Stuttgart uh, um, and um, so this is coming more and more, in, but in the UK, it's much more uh, uh, present, that's, that's true. Um, if we're talking about members like this, it's a very simple example because it's really like a kit of parts, the stadium um, with uh, straight elements. It's not very, um, uh, I mean, the elegance of this venue to me, having developed it, it comes from other things than the architectural beauty. It's, uh, um, but I find it very beautiful, but it's a, it's a member with a specific length and with a specific capacity. So if you are able to understand and remember actually what that is, you can use it for a new configuration. And if you then use it up only to 70% of its capacity, it doesn't matter, you still use it. You know, you're not throwing it away. You're not um, uh, ha having to reuse the energy to produce something that is then maybe 100% utilized. 
um, and and that's this uh, in, in steel structures is maybe a little bit simpler because you can measure the, the plate thickness and then you can calculate it with concrete. It's it's uh, harder because you it's you need more technology to look to look into the concrete to understand the reinforcement and the carbonization uh, status and whatever to understand if you can still use it or or, or not. But it's and, uh, it's uh, going to be very important in the near future. And as you can see here with this venue, it's worthwhile keeping things because uh, uh, it's a magical place. And uh, actually, we have a very nice lecture tomorrow afternoon about reuse of members. Jan, make more advertisements for that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hugo? Yes, I, I would like to make a, a comment about uh, the hand calculations. So um, hand calculations versus, versus models. Yes, hand calculation has have uh, limitations because you are not able to represent reality. But with the models, you have big uh, limitations to represent the reality. The reality is, is very difficult to be represented. And we have the possibility to, to make a, a pathetic uh, representation of reality. Uh, so um, I understand that young people is, uh, is more, have the habit to, to work with models, but uh, I, I really believe that if you had, have uh, hand calculations, you have the, the possibility in the tip of your pencil to have results and to understand. If you have model, you have a good uh, ability to, to make models, but you produce millions of, of uh, outputs and you don't know exactly which one is important. And you need to really have a, a previous approximation to be able to find in this model and to correct that model. So uh, probably in the future, we will have more better tools to make models, uh, but we need really to uh, understand that we need to understand the behavior of the structure. Absolutely. And the hand calculations are a tool, probably simple models are the second step. And finally, when you get confidence in the future, in, in the next steps, complex models, could you help for a specific things, yeah. especially for, for construction, when you need to really know how is the geometry, the final geometry of a bridge, of a final geometry of a cable, the, the tension cable in a stadium, for example. Yeah. So uh, uh, this is something we have to, uh, to understand. Uh, we need to have a control of the structure. I could imagine that George was making, was using ever a computer by himself. <laughs> but uh, he was able to make uh, this stair in the tower in Stuttgart, and the stair is supported by cables. The cables are, have not any stiffness, and, and for him, and he was working personally in that project. I remember that we were visiting that um, tower uh, in the night one day I was in Stuttgart, and he knew perfectly the behavior, probably not the level of stresses in some point. And this is something somebody else could do. But uh, this is important. We need to control our, our, our projects with uh, different tools and uh, hand calculations are a very good beginning. I, I, I really appreciate, I enjoy when I obtain good results and, and I enjoy it like, like you, but I understand that many other people, young people uh, are not, have not that experience, but uh, we need to go from the simple things to the more complex things. It's impossible to go directly to the complex one. And the second um, idea is sustainability. Um, reuse. Uh, circular <laughs> economy and all these things. I, I have to say that I started to think seriously in all these aspects recently. And I don't know if the situation of you is different from 
my situation. But we need to make an effort to create that culture in our uh, community. We need to have a culture. Now we need to we have the culture for the safety. We have the culture for the durability, but the, we need to incorporate in a more concrete way and probably this will be treated in our next conceptual design uh, symposium. Thank you. May I, may yeah, I of think? course, please. Oh, did you want to go first? I, uh, both. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you, Ugo, for, for those comments. I, I'd like to say that um, um, general purpose methods of analysis, you know, what we normally use today for structural analysis, the promise of those methods was basically, oh, we can analyze anything, and therefore we're going to have better engineering better design. And that promise really was an empty promise in many, many regards. The thing with the hand calculations, and I think it's really, um, it's really useful, helpful to look at structures that were designed before the advent of digital computers and ask the questions, how did they do it? Because we see time and time again, some very, very complex structures that nowadays You'd give it to an engineer. I'm not going to say young engineer or old engineer, any engineer, and they just put it into a general purpose method of analysis. The way the engineers in those days were able to design and design well and provide the level of reliability that was expected was that they developed an a priori understanding of the structural behavior. Coupled with design insight, I think, the, the, the two kind of went together very, 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 very closely, an integration of analysis and design, so that you could take a very, on the surface, seemingly complex structure and say, well, actually the behavior is not quite as complex as it looks because of perhaps certain measures I'm going to put into in design, and therefore I can do this, this, this. One of the classic examples that I always think of in that regard are the um, deck stiffened arches of Robert Maillard. And these are highly statically indeterminate structures on the surface. And the engineers of Maillard's contemporaries would have said, well, it's, it's just not feasible to analyze these using, I don't know what they would have used, moment distribution or something like that at that stage. But basically by saying, well, look, I can look at this structure and understand that if the girder is very stiff, then the arch will see very, very little bending. And on that basis, I can move towards um, a feasible way to calculate the forces in the structure using hand methods. I think that what was really lost when we went to this wholesale adoption of the general purpose methods of analysis was this... Um, uh, abandoning in many cases, this developing an a priori understanding for the behavior of the structures coupled with sort of a very, very tight integration of design and analysis. That's what we lost. But that's something that, that, uh, that we need to teach basically in our offices. It's, it's, we can't just push the responsibility to the universities and say like, well, you need to educate properly so that we get people uh, and, and young professionals who know how to, how to understand the structures. It's something that it's a constant procedure uh, um, and that's something that should just become a standard. Uh, all we're, we're in it together. We're both yes. players on the same team. Ex exactly, that's yeah. what I mean. So, yeah. and, um, but that um, um, requires also a certain respect for, um, for the, what we do you know, and, uh, and for the beauty of it and for the purpose of it. And uh, sustainability is maybe a good aspect or a, it's a good keyword to uh, sell this idea or sell this, this uh, approach because um, it's just one word, but it describes so many things and everyone interprets it a little bit different. Um, and uh, it's very important to reuse materials, but it's not, the, it's not salvation at the end of the day. Um, it's not the only path. So uh, we need to reuse, we need to understand what is here, we need to understand what is, how did they build this in order to use it for the next hundred years. We need to um, uh, engage with the community to understand how they want to use it. Are they happy here or not? And um, because uh, happiness and uh, things like that um, are also very important uh, sustainability 
uh, criterion. And uh, so all of this together um, will improve things. And um, I hope that we can jointly achieve that. Thank you very much. Just to add a word about the structural models. Uh, I think as it has been discussed and, and very interesting comments by, by Hugo, I, I think of, of course, structural models and existing tools are there to stay. And I think a, a key point is how we transmit, how we teach this, both the students and at the office, how to use these models. And I think what, but what we are trying to transmit to the students at the university and at the office is that what is important on the models, and actually I think it's similar when you do it by hand, is what happens before the model and after the model. I mean, you, you, we try to, to tell them that they have to spend like 45% of the time thinking on the boundary conditions of the models. Is this a support? Is it spin? How are you introduce the loads? I introduce it directly to this element or to these others. How are the boundary conditions? And other 45% analyzing the results. Um, important thing is which results I, lo I look before. And the temptation is, is there to, 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 to press the button, check a structure and see if any element is in red. But actually, this is not what, what we should do. But you can but change the like it's like, like a large <laughs> button, so everybody touches it. But actually, if you think which results are important in a structure, if it's deflection, if you should check torsional bending moments, or if it's a shear that you should check before, you are thinking a lot on the structure, even if you are using a, a complex tool. So we try to then tell them 45% before the model, 45% after the model, and maybe the less 10% doing actually the model. But actually the reality is that they usually spend like 95% doing the model and 2% in thinking of monetary conditions and 1% pressing the bottom of, uh, of check results. But, but I think that the, part of the problem is also that uh, these models have, have evolved so much also in the, it's called in, in the graphical context of the models. So when I started working with models, to check the results was not so easy. So, so you had to, to, when you press for the result, you had to wait like five minutes or 10 minutes. So you thought before pressing the button, which results as you wanted to look. Now, since it's so quickly, you press and after you think that. Uh, so the temptation is there, but, but I think it's, uh, it's coming. I mean, it's something we, because the, if you think in the model is that way, I think it's not very different the way you will think in doing it by hand. But, but again, uh, it, 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 uh, it's it's uh, it's somehow part of the philosophy how 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 you run your office and how you mm. uh, educate your people. I remember well um, as a very young engineer um, going to Mr. Bergman's room, yeah, being called, come, and I came and said hi, uh, and then we spoke about a project, and he I would explain how I analyzed it and whatever, and he said first nothing. That was always a bad sign because um, sweat was building up with me and and then he said like i don't think that's right please go check it again <laughs> and he, he nothing has you, you just you get up and you're like okay that's the end and then you go back and you and you check properly and then you find it you see it yeah but um and and that I, I will never forget that so it educated me also and um and that's something that i also, also try to um pass on because it's a, it's a fundamental lection uh, lecture to uh yeah, to get better yeah there are a lot of questions so maybe Does it's that work yes. yeah and then we jump from yeah. home and then we have some people more in the audience yeah, i yeah. have a more general question to knut stockhusen um we, we make the experience that uh, you, you improve the quality of your conceptual design uh, by doing it to the end, I mean, to the construction side. You, you basically do all the time conceptual design from the large scale to the small scale. Now, we, we see what SVP does and you, you do it all over the world. And for sure, there is an experience that comes back as a feedback from the construction side. And, as you have projects all over the world and the, and, and the greater team, I just was wondering 
how you bring back this experience from the last, you know, the last crew that that fits or not or fits not, but it fits in your case <laughs> in the construction back to the office. And what is your strategy to to improve the quality of conceptual design relating on what you learn on site by your people? Thank you. Um, that's that's a very um, that's a very good point and um, very important. Um, part of our of our work, I'm assuming that's not our, in our, only in our case. It's in in most cases. But um, first of all, we really try to guide a project from the first sketch until it's really handed over, and preferably through the lifetime of a project as well. So we are now still working on the Olympic roof in, in Munich, and that's uh, 50 years ago. So. Um, and that's that's very important because we we feedback what we learn as you uh, said we have uh, internal sessions uh, where we uh, talk about projects we uh, try to um, tell everybody that it's okay to make a mistake you know so the the culture of talking about your own mistakes is really important especially from the management so um yeah i could uh, speak more about my mistakes but that would probably exceed the session here so, but it's really important because you reflect and you get better and uh, and you only very rarely make the mistake twice. And what is also important is that we establish a very good relationship with those who, uh, uh, let's say, build it. Um, that's because they are the true magicians at the end of the day. Um, and, um, and that we also listen to them because they know many things better than we do. Um, and so it's a good synergy um, of um, yeah, enhancing things. We have a SBB Academy where we uh, uh, meet uh, with internals, but also with external experts to learn also from others uh, to yeah, keep on refreshing our memories and uh, also how problems are solved by others. So it's a constant learning curve, I would say. And trial and error is also very important. Thank you, Pierluigi. I cannot see you, but yes, uh, thank you, I'm on the structures at the DH Zurich. And uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate this excellent panel. Very interesting points. Uh, there could be a lot that could be added to the hand versus analysis uh, discussion, uh, but I widely agree with everything that has been said. I would even say that currently still the paper is the only design tool we have because the tools we are talking about uh, and call design tools, the digital ones, are mostly still an analysis tool. But at university in structural engineering research, we are trying to push this forward so that they actually become more design tools. But I actually want to make a different point because uh, I think from this panel, we might hear very interesting points about this. We've heard two very correct uh, statements about sustainability uh, and how we need to design and uh, construct uh, in a sustainable manner that if you think about it are both very right but at the opposite end of things. On one hand we have heard that the best structure is the one that isn't even built so a, a little bit following the banana philosophy built absolutely nothing anywhere near anyone that is <laughs> and going around a little bit uh, but I understand completely what you mean, and I can fully agree with this. Uh, let's keep our structures as long as possible. Uh, on the other hand, I've heard we need to uh, reduce the use of material as much as possible, build uh, the most lightweight structure we can possibly imagine. And as a steel structures guy, I absolutely agree with this. Lightweight structures are fantastic, but they're very conflicting um, messages. For example, this very lightweight truss will meet its untimely end because too soon, let's say, because it was built with very little material. And even though it's just statically loaded, it will uh, not withstand as much as like a modern prefabricated beam of this size. And you could also say that the Pantheon in Rome, for example, is uh, maybe not extremely sustainable how it was built originally, but after 2000 years it is. So what would you say? Uh, what is the best strategy then really? Lightweight, but we use it so little uh, of material that it will deteriorate quickly or extremely heavyweight, like these walls here, that could withstand 500 years, maybe? If, if I'm to answer, I would say that uh, it's a little bit of all. Um, of course, I'm a defender of light structures uh, because um, we, we live now and we have to uh, um, secure uh, resources now. Um, 
but uh, on the other hand, we also need to understand how, how much margin for flexibility, for flexibility of future change of use, for example, we can um, implement and still um, uh, work with a reasonably light system. Um, you know that if you if you just look at the, uh, a conventional concrete slab like a flat slab in office buildings that's the most common um, concrete use over the past decades there are so many good ideas um, to um, follow alternative routes which use 50 60 or 80 percent less concrete and still perform equally well um, and that's already that's already a uh, let's say a giant leap into uh, the direction of lighter structures and also into a more sustainable use of um, of material. So um, does that answer your question? <laughs> Can we have another perspective? <laughs> we have many questions. Yes. The first one. That might be a bit strange if I want to ask it like this. I'm not biologist, but I'm structuralist. I think all of us are structuralists, but I just want to get inspired from biology and ask question in terms of structural engineering. What happened with COVID-19 was just started with the primary virus, and then we had the Delta variant, Alpha variant, Lambda variant, et cetera, et cetera. What we learned is, virus is smart, right? Then I think also construction materials is smart as well. Uh, now, given that if a material is loaded, it goes on to in a stress scenario. Uh, maybe a question for you, Knut. Uh, how can you guarantee that a structure that is built in Doha for 55 degrees can be built in some province, for example, in Saskatchewan in Canada for minus 42 degrees? Or maybe I can be inspired by the discussion we had before lunch where one of our colleagues said, uh, the, the anatomy of uh, our humankind is like structural engineers. How can you guarantee that if you just take a bone from our leg, which went into a compressive load, can be replaced by you know, our hands and can be used? Thank you. That's a, it's a good question. And uh, of course, there is no general um, recipe for this. So we can't design something that can be used uh, uh, anywhere. But um, it's, um, I think it's surprisingly compatible because, because um, uh, sometimes, for example, the temperature loads are higher, but uh, other loads are reduced and it will never replace, an, let's say, a reassessment to the new location. You also, you would, if we are talking about this stadium thing there, um, so you would, for example, have to uh, assess the seismic conditions in the, at the new location. You need to um, check the ground conditions and so on. And to, um, there are certain things that need to be adjusted, maybe, or um, maybe the, there are limitations resulting about, uh, out of this new assessment in terms of new height or new dimensions of this building. Or maybe you have to build in more expansion joints if the temperature distribution is differently. So it's... Uh, such, a, uh, such an, an idea that does not replace the, um, thinking and uh, proper processing um, and proper assessment of the new location. And it, will not, it cannot be replaced by a machine because you need to, um, you need to understand um, what's going on, there, on at the other location. There's one um, aspect out of this, um, like this reassessment and it creates work, right? Um, this is not a business development trip uh, a trick by us, don't worry, um, but, but it creates work and it's also a sustainability aspect that we need to consider. And that was Jörg Schleich's main interest actually to understand how uh, a local community works and uh, look at the bridge in Calcutta. It was, uh, it was built over decades um, by local forces with, uh, with the use of rivets because that's the only merging technology that uh, was basically known to this community in India. And, um, and it's, it's a very old story, but it's, uh, it's more, uh, um, let's say contemporary than anything could be because that's something that has to be understood um, and we need to consider the human being and the, and the workforce and so on and if we become more people more and more people we also need to have more work so if everything is replaced by robotic construction and uh, the analysis is done by a computer what do we do you know I mean I would know some things but uh, not it's for 11 billion people is uh, 
Um, so we need also to um, evolve in a way that we um, keep on thinking and working on things and doing things with our hands and so on, because at the end of the day, we are just humans and uh, we continue being like this. Thank you. Yeah. John, I guess. Yeah, hello, I'm Jan Britting from EP, uh, formerly EPFL, now SPP. <laughs> um, one question, um, Alejandro said, we have to reclaim the design process for us as engineers, architects, whoever. Um, so the, the process takes time to, to really develop good projects. And also we talk about sustainability and we all agree what we have to do. And it's consens now, I think, that we have to do better. But how do you sell this um, to your clients? Like, how do you, how can you say, I really, if, I, if you want a very good quality project, I need a little bit of time. I cannot give you an answer tomorrow. And also you have to consider sustainability aspects because we have a huge footprint on the world. Um, do you, how do you approach your clients? Or on the other hand, will you at some point just give up and say, okay, I have to go with his um, opinion because they are paying you at the end? Good question. <laughs> Actually, that's that's one of the of the problems, uh, and it's true that usually clients are difficult that they understand that they should spend more time and more money in the first phases of the project in developing a proper project, a complete project, and that will mean an ease of construction afterwards and a more economic construction afterwards. And um, this, it seems like it should be clear, but uh, it's true that usually it's not the case and we are asked to do it in less and less time. Mm, but I think it's something that can be somehow transmit to the client. Of course, it depends of a lot in the client, but sometimes they, they understand and they see results. Sometimes also if, 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 if if you manage that they take part of this process, I mean, that they are not like waiting for the project to arrive, but they are involved in the process and see how it evolves and, and what are the results and he gets implicated, it's, it's easier, but uh, I totally agree. It's one of the, of the problems. And that's also why it's good to have these symposiums and these discussions so because uh, what the client represent actually is uh, what the society sees of, of structural engineering so if we manage together to to transmit society what we do what can we do and what's the important social concerns to which uh, structural engineering can address uh, that's, that will help a lot I think. Um, I think it's also important to understand better and to to investigate in the direction of uh, um, how a sustainable or a more sustainable approach can become also more economic, because it's it's not necessarily. So we need first of all we need to accept that uh, we have to look at the uh, at the total at the overall balance of things. So we if you for example uh, build. Um, a high-rise building from timber, it's for sure not cheaper than building it from concrete. Um, but uh, in the overall context of its lifetime, uh, it's better. It might be better. It's not uh, guaranteed better, but it might be better. And that's something that we have to evaluate. Um, but of course, we also have, will have to convince clients and authorities and whoever wants to build something that uh, the decision to act more reasonable and more uh, rational and more sustainable costs cost money. Because if we continue to do the cheapest, then it's a concrete flat slab and uh, uh, that's maybe not the solution. So yeah, I think in, it, it, this happens more in architecture than in engineering, but sometimes with the client may, might have the, may have the impression that this design process is for the own sake of the engineer or the architect. And actually what we have to transmit is this is for the own sake of the project. This is not that we are spending more time and more analysis and more thinking on the project because of, of ourselves, but because we because it actually will mean a better project and a better and this will maybe be linked together to try to do an effort from ourselves 
to understand what are the, the client necessities also, not, not being also like only asking for the for the project, but trying to, to be involved. And at the end, I think it's kind of communication. Maybe we have time for just one question there, yeah? It's just two points. I'm Bernardino Chiaia from Torino Politecnico, Italy. Uh, of course, our structures uh, were built and are built mainly to sustain gravity and forces. And so uh, the title of the session brings me to ask you something about other drivers for structural design. Uh, one is sustainability for sure, and someone else already raised this point. I, I would like to uh, ask you for two different drivers. Uh, do you happen to be stimulated for multifunctional design of structures? I mean, for instance, using concrete for heat storage at the same time when concrete is working as a bearing system, uh, using concrete for uh, like a skin. Uh, we have in Milano examples at the Expo for uh, transparent concrete and so on. So uh, again, biology is an inspiration. Our bones not only sustain the body, but also have the marrow inside for blood and nervous functioning. Uh, so first question is uh, for multifunctional design. Second question, and this is particularly for the Canadian professor uh, who spoke about the standard bridges, the standard bridges. Uh, after the collapse in Italy of the Morandi bridge, in uh, 2018, uh, one big issue is maintenance. So, uh, but still there is no design for maintenance. Uh, I believe that we civil engineers, we architects should learn something from our uh, mechanical or aeronautical uh, colleagues who design their tools already for maintenance. I, I think it is, very strange that still we need a very heavy and expensive procedure to substitute the bearings of a little bridge. A 30 meters bridge requires a lot of time and costs for substituting the bearings, for substituting the safety barriers, the water drainage, the de-icing system and so on. So uh, my questions are uh, in this case, if design for maintenance, maintenance is entering the bridge design process or still is not and the first question is for multifunctional design thanks thank you well i i'll take the first question and yeah. you take the <laughs> second um the the multifunctional design i think is um, um is a very good point um they, of course there's there are attempts to um, to not only create uh, buildings or uh, systems that can adapt to, uh, let's say, changing conditions, um, but also components and, and materials. We have this uh, infralight concrete, which uh, um, is a, well, basically a floating uh, uh, concrete recipe, which is uh, self-insulating and uh, the purpose is to uh, replace these hybrid systems of uh, or sandwich systems with um, rock wool or glass wool insulation, uh, which is which has to be used at, uh, in Germany, for example, on every private building. Um, I think now you have to go to 24 centimeters or something to uh, fulfill the building requirements or something like that. So um, there are attempts to um, propose this material. This is more expensive than going the conventional way. So you need people who uh, like the ambition, the, like the challenge of proving that uh, despite the financial impact, technically it works and it might work better. Um, and uh, that is only the constant application of such material can, can change the market there. Uh, I think actually that there's quite some lobby is who are uh, interested to keep things as they are because it's a big industry uh, behind all these things um, so um, that's maybe another aspect that would need to be discussed and uh, maybe um, by modifying codal requirements and so on um, we could also have an impact here Jörg Schleich actually said just to refer uh, to him again um, that as long as you have clean energy 
you could actually do whatever you want with that energy, energy because it's uh, renewable. And uh, the next morning you uh, open the window and it's there again, basically. So um, that's something that uh, is somehow uh, a circle of events that have to take place in order to improve things. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, maybe I'll start just by clarifying a point of terminology. Um, I never used the term standard bridge and I wanna make a distinction. I talked about practical bridges and I was referring to small or medium type bridges. I don't like standard bridges. I'm against the standardization of the primary structural system. I think that designers should design what they think is best for the given set of conditions that are at hand. If we're gonna standardize bridges, we might as well all pack up and go home because there's nothing really left for us to do. Um, with regards to design for maintenance, I think that, you know, from the time that the Morandi Bridge was built to the present day, I think that great strides have been made in improving the intrinsic durability of bridges. We have better concretes, we have better knowledge of the mechanisms, the transport mechanisms of things like uh, chlorides uh, into the concrete to the level of reinforcement. And we have implemented that knowledge into design standards. Um, for many small bridges, we design them now, you know, as integral bridges without bearings, without expansion joints. And so I think we have made great strides in that regard. We're far from perfect, but I would say that there's only so much that we as engineers can do especially when you see that staring us right in the face is the responsibility of the owner. And I think that if an owner is going to build a bridge, they should take on that responsibility of replacing the bearings at sort of a reasonable cycle. I don't really see a, a, a huge problem with that. If an owner persists in not replacing those bearings when they need to be replaced, I'm not sure if that's necessarily the fault of the design engineer. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we don't have more time to do, we, we can ask probably during the coffee. So thank you very much for coming and for joining this conversation.